All right, thanks everybody and, and welcome back. Uh, I want to give you a few minutes there to take a quick break. Uh, and I know some of the uh, ran a little bit long in a couple of the, the workshops that everybody was having such great discussions. Uh, Jackie or Craig, do, does one of you want to start off? I, I was hoping each group could give about a five minute uh, kind of report of some of the highlights and what they talked about. So organizing um, my notes as I was drastically uh, trying to listen as intently as I could and then um, scribbling notes down here. It was an incredible conversation, um, getting insights from, from big players, from uh, Kay Taylor at BD and Al Alan Wright at Roche, and then the interaction with the FDA, uh, Tim Stenzel and Larry Cohn were um, really, really um, insightful. And I think I, I learned so many things and I think our audience did too. Um, when I gave them the chance to ask their many questions. There were a lot of new programs to me. I think uh, a lot of our talk was around demystifying the regulatory process and democratizing access to the FDA. Um, there's you know, new programs that I learned about included the FDA um, DEES, which is where you get to talk to subject matter experts and ask some particular questions of them in real time. You don't have to go through the whole FDA submission process just to get short answers. Um, there's new submissions around breakthrough technologies and in March upcoming is a safer technologies program. So it doesn't have to be a completely breakthrough technology, but if it's gonna drastically improve patient safety, then um, you can also go to the FDA with those uh, very early on in the process and they, they really help you know the sprint process and, and are constantly interacting with the innovators. Uh, there's also a pre-EUA submission for those of us in diagnostics that are looking at COVID. Um, there's even a, co EUA is significantly less uh, paperwork and, and less uh, rigor to a full submission or full approvals, but uh, you don't actually have to come fully uh, fully sure of how that's going to work anyway. You can go through the pre-EUA process and, and learn and, and get interaction with uh, FDA regulators. And so that's incredibly helpful. We talked about uh, modifications uh, due to COVID-19. Um, there are a few thousand applications going in on any normal year. And now there are a few thousand additional ones that are just related to the COVID EUAs this year. Um, and so that has meant that uh, companies are reducing their timelines from two to five years down to months to get new technologies out the door and new diagnostics. Uh, they're running analytical tests in real time as they're developing the clinical protocols uh, and uh, in some cases on a daily basis are interacting with FDA uh, officials to be able to continue everyone's learning as we go. Um, it has uh, definitely changed the framework of what you can do uh, concurrently and uh, companies risk tolerance because of this emergency uh, has, has really shifted. And I think some of that's gonna, gonna hopefully continue uh, as we see some of the great innovations, the first molecular diagnostics uh, in, at, at the point of care and actually home tests have come out in the last year. And it's really been a um, as Tim said, necessity is the mother of invention, and there have been some incredible inventions in the last year that have gotten out the door. Um, we also talked uh, just towards the end, we, we got a little bit of a chance to talk about the process of uh, when academics should be reaching out to companies and when companies are interested in technologies. Uh, if you have a leapfrog technology as an academic, then you know, go early, but otherwise you really need to make sure you're proving your rigor and uh, the reproducibility and um, making sure that this is uh, an investment that the company can uh, can trust and, and de-risking a lot of the processes for them because diagnostics are, are quite competitive and uh, have um, lower margins than things like new vaccines. So the risk tolerance is generally lower if they're going to be picking up new uh, new startups and new uh, academic uh, innov innovations. There's there's a ton more, and I'm happy to provide more detailed and more organized notes uh, for anybody who's interested. 
but I think I'll, I'll let other folks get a chance to get a word in edgewise too. Craig, would you like to talk about your group? No, that was great, Jackie. And, and sorry, I forgot to, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, Jackie, you probably uh, figured out that we're doing the diagnostics breakout. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I was so excited, I jumped right in. <laughs> And now I hate to, I know we always should make these works up longer. It's always that balance. So, uh, Craig, do you want to give a quick uh, rundown on the pediatric discussion? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Aaron. Um, we had a wonderful discussion. And if you're willing, I'm actually going to share my screen because I took advantage of um, my grad student and had him put together slides based on our discussion. Uh, so pro tip, uh, use that to uh, take advantage. Somebody can see my um slides uh is this the, the presenter mode or do you have the other yeah mode? We're, we're seeing presenter mode okay one second is that better yep okay all right so we had uh dr nicole ibrahim talk um and give a, a couple case study examples of um the cardiovascular disease so she's um works at the fda and has um, got a lot of experience in describing different uh, pathways to, to get to patients with pma the humanitarian device exemption or other breakthrough programs. So she gave an examples uh, related to mechanical heart valves. Um, normally, right, these are requiring up to 800 patient years for approval, but in the pediatric population, you can work with the FDA and the uh, example of uh, PMA approval with uh, only 20 patients. Another example was the Amplatzer occluder to, to um, occlude septal uh, uh, defects between atria or the ventricles. Drastically less clinical data was required for PMA approval, um, knowing that the patient populations for these pediatrics, uh, pediatric groups aren't, aren't going to be um, able to, to meet those high numbers. Dr. Susan Alpert uh, is currently a consultant, but she worked previously both for uh, Medtronic and the FDA. And so she, she has experience in the industry and regulatory and now um, working with small companies too in her role as a consultant. And really thinking that and, and splitting up the pediatric populations are incredibly different from neonates all the way up to 22 years old. You can't treat them all the same and there's gonna be a big difference in, in the 18 to 22 year old age range from those that are in just a few weeks of their uh, early life. And not only can you think about using adult um, data to get pediatric approval, but even older pediatric data could help with approval for younger pediatric patients as well. So uh, neurological implantable device um, are, are you know, already approved for 18 years or older, and they, they leverage this adult data for the pediatric indications, or at least thought about that, and that's what her role as a consultant has been able to provide. Um, and so she's really thinking and helping these companies figure out how to navigate with the FDA to, to make sure that they uh, provide the best case for these uh, this, this smaller patient population, uh, thinking about what exactly they need to collect during their clinical studies. Dr. David Reuter, we know well, is an alum of our, our program here at Purdue, MD, PhD, and now is a pediatrician out at Seattle. Um, I know him on a preeclampsia project that we work with closely together, but back in 2000, he started a company based on um, uh, disease of the mitral valve. And this is a shared a, a personal story of a specific patient that developed heart failure uh, due to um, the uh, actually giving birth and, and the congestive heart failure that um, overloaded her heart afterwards. So developing a device that could be Im implanted uh, minimally invasively. And he really talked about his personal experience with the four phases of development, unmet needs, analysis, iteration, and then testing going from benchtop to animals all the way to clinical trials. And realizing, right, that his one major focus that the pediatric disease uh, populations are very um, uh, heterogeneous. And as adults can be considered um, with very, very precise uh, risk uh, profiles and uh, disease populations, whereas pediatrics is going to have a much more heterogeneous population. So. Uh, that's that's going to be considered as you you go through this device device iteration process. Um, we talked about this decision point and that you need a lot of momentum to where you, to get to approval before starting to diversify and to think about other areas uh, in, in case there's a risk that something doesn't work out as you expect. Um, you know, a lot of discussion points that we expanded upon for questions as well at the end regarding investments, disease to, to targets, um, what makes you unique compared to competition, and then um, thinking about risk as well. And finally, Dr. Devlin, uh, FDA as well as chief medical officer there uh, in the orthopedic space, uh, needs uh, thought, talk, talked a little bit about a couple of different devices, three case studies, but one was about um, flexibility and, and regulations for pediatric devices um, and, and which uh, marketing pathways, 510K, de novo, PMA, or the humanitarian exemption. Uh, 
And so we gave examples of the 510K with a posterior spinal system for fusion, uh, the HDE pathway for fusionless correction of pediatric scoliosis, and then finally, the de novo pathway uh, example with ACL repair, you know, this implant that goes inside of it. So he, uh, as part of his uh, role as chief medical officer, was able to um, identify three great examples of how to successfully navigate those, those pathways, and that all, all were different, but uh, each of those companies was able to get to market this way, these ways. So in the discussion portion, um, we had a, a, a lot of buy-in and interest from not only uh, several pediatricians at Riley, but also at um, Med Institute uh, and Cook. And so we're centered a little bit around the role of the IRB, Internal Review Board, uh, and Institutional Review Board in, in relation to this device exemption. Is it needed? To, is it, what's the value? Um, so Dr. Alpert provided that she was there actually when at FDA when HDEs were, were being initiated. And, um, relying, um, I think some discussion actually went around whether or not we want a central IRB to help with that process instead of going through local IRBs, but likely there still need to be communication between the two regardless. So thinking about um, institutional awareness, maybe that could be a, a, a thought to help um, encourage or, or increase the, the awareness of what's needed for um, some of the, the um, reviews for HDE exemptions from the IRB side as well as clinician side, engineering side. Could be helpful. We know great answers, but I, th I think there's some um, um, areas there that need to be approved. Uh, encouraging devices that could be considered for pediatric populations when, when originally considered for adult populations. We had a, a little bit of discussion there and realized that um, and, and came to the conclusion that we can't just say that everything like we do in, in drugs can be applied to devices, right? You can't make it taste better or have it at a, be given at a smaller dosage when you're thinking about something that's going to be inside of a, a child versus a, a full grown adult. Uh, there's actually current legislation under uh, review right now, federal legislation that's going to be considered. So uh, there's discussion about how we can work with lobbyists and representatives to, to think about revisions of this HDE pathway and what, what can we do to improve IRB review or um, even you know, reimbursements and other um, uh, issues related to pediatric devices. So uh, everybody call their local representative if you have a, a specific topic of interest for you. And then finally, um, how to best leverage the complementary expertise in Indiana and thinking about MD PhD involvement. Should we uh, work to combine academic, industrial, clinical expertise? And that's something that us in the Weldon School are already thinking about and wanting to, to grow our, our partnerships with Riley Hospital for Children and as well as Cook Medical, Cook Research, Cook Biotech, Cook Regentech, and the different uh, Cook companies so that we can build on our, our academic, industrial, and clinical expertise to, to make a consortium. And, Maybe someday we're, we'll be thinking about applying for um, FDA funding to be one of the, these pediatric consortia that are, there's five of them around the country already. Um, or maybe we think about working with the, the SHIP MD consortia. Aaron, I know we've been learning a lot about that recently as they develop um, thinking about ways that we can be part of that here in Indiana. So that's what we talked about as uh, uh, our, uh, in our pediatric breakout session. Awesome, okay. Um, Yvonne, do you wanna talk about digital health? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, we, we had uh, two wonderful presentations. Um, first was uh, uh, Mr. Bakul Patel, as we all know, uh, he's the founding director from FDA's Digital Health Center of Excellence. Um, so besides uh, providing an overview of the mission uh, and scope of work uh, for, for the group, um, it, I, I think one important uh, take home for me anyway, is uh, thinking about um, the, the paradigm shift uh, required from uh, more of the traditional um, device world, which is more hardware based, uh, shifting into uh, more of a digital device world uh, that's uh, software based um, with much uh, shorter um, life cycle management. Uh, the, the nature of the beast has changed, uh, incremental, iterative, the absolute uh, necessity uh, to be agile uh, with frequent you know, modifications to um, the, the tools that we build. And uh, you know, the, the sheer volume and availability of uh, post-market data. So it was uh, an interesting uh, 
you know, uh, discussion and, 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 and thoughts uh, around that. There was so much uh, covered, so I'll, I'll just hit some uh, highlights. Uh, similarly, uh, Dr. Sabu, uh, thank you, Tron, I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced your, your last name. So uh, he's the CTO of uh, Echo Devices. Um, we we used um, well, spoke about you know uh, the the topics that's pretty uh, top of mind for a lot of the registrants. Just understanding uh, FDA's regulation on wearable devices. You know the range of uh, applications from wearable, uh, from wellness uh, on regulated realm to medical, where that threshold lies. Uh, that that frequently. For many reasons, there there is such a, a gray zone, and and just helping the registrants to to start you know wrapping our heads around um, what what that could look like, and how to initially uh, reach out to the FDA, um, you know, with with questions, just to initiate the dialogue and not wait too long, uh, where you you know are invested down a path only to find out uh, much later on that perhaps um, it was not the optimal path and, uh, and recognizing that a lot of our uh, digital health colleagues out there uh, may not have a, a, you know, a, a huge group uh, with a regulatory team who, who could uh, take on um, that work. So uh, just being mindful of uh, the, the whole spectrum of uh, potential folks out there who, who are just trying to navigate the space and, and recognizing some of the challenges they may have. So uh, uh, at least pointed them to, to a particular uh, FDA email address uh, as a starting point for some of that, that initial discussion. But again, the, the message is uh, pretty loud and clear and consistent, I think, throughout the the conference that the FDA, um, they're you know they're here to to help us, um, and uh, so they'll they'll play their part to to try to be responsive and and, and helpful uh, whenever possible. Um, so back to Sabu's uh, topic, I thought another important and well besides touching on some of the uh, non medical applications from Apple, Fitbit. Um, and then uh, to some of the um, new advances that involve uh, AI algorithms, right? Or, or in this particular case, uh, we, we talked about one particular tool, which is an ECG-based stethoscope. Um, and uh, the, the point is that um, in this digital health space, when we're trying to design um, and build a tool, to always um, keep the end users in mind, although it's sometimes it's tempting because of, you know, aggressive uh, deadlines or, or budgetary constraints, but not to if you don't involve the voice of the customer and all types of end users from the get go. Um, you know, you could just anticipate how how the outcome would be suboptimal, and uh, so so early uh, early and frequent inputs um, from them. Uh, do the appropriate usability testing, human factors sometimes uh, would be warranted. So uh, again, it's uh, the, the point isn't to finish building a product and deploy it or even push it to the regulatory process. Uh, it's about ultimately, you know, is it going to be adopted? Is it useful? Um, and, and is it really serving, um, you know, our patients or uh, whomever the customer are, uh, winds up being? And uh, yeah, so thinking about uh, not just the, the build, but also the deployment in these uh, real world settings, whether it's healthcare or a patient's home setting, whatever it winds up being. And that some it's not just a tool, it's all the wraparound services that may be required for different types of patients, right? Uh, different types of patients or customers have different needs and, and being mindful of uh, uh, what may be needed there. Okay, um, there was one shout out to uh, Digital Medicine Society. I think this actually, um, Aaron, you, you had asked that we we, uh, we at least talk about, well, let's make sure today's conference isn't a, you know, a uh, one, one time deal and now we move on with our work and lives and we forget about it. So, so how can we uh, find opportunities? 
uh, for some ongoing engagement collaboration. Um, I, I myself and, and Bacol were, were part of, uh, uh, I shouldn't speak on, on his behalf without his permission, <laughs> but, but we're on the scientific uh, steering committee for the Digital Medicine uh, Society. It's a nonprofit where uh, a lot of uh, different types of uh, stakeholders uh, who are really invested in, in digital health could, could come together uh, and work together. So that's one avenue uh, for folks in the space who, who would like to find a community uh, to, and a sounding board and resources. And, and one uh, resource I did point out, um, because this was one of the Russian registrants question is around uh, digital endpoints. So um, the, the society, uh, Dime Society published a, uh, a digital endpoint uh, library and um, I'm sh pretty sure it's open access. So you don't even have to join. You don't have to be a member to access it. Uh, so uh, it's uh, something for, for the group to, to look into if it's of interest. So thank you. Sorry if I rambled a little bit. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Misty or Hugh, I don't know who was giving the report out. and uh, We're getting close on time, so please go ahead. I don't mind there, unless you'd like to hear. Um, so in our breakout session, we discussed some of the challenges regarding uh, device development from ideation through regulation and evaluation and eventually coverage. Um, how to engage clinicians early in the process to help with ideation. Um, I like one comment where they've developed uh, all the devices. They, they've, they've discovered all the devices in their sleep that haven't been able to uh, incorporate them or study them and bring them to fruition. So it's important to involve the, cl the clinicians and also involving the patients and the end user early on um, and understanding their needs towards the end. Uh, we discussed engaging with the FDA, but also engaging with the community, um, such as regulatory science groups, uh, in order to develop evaluation strategies. And then um, once you understand your device and your device evaluation strategy, going to the FDA, uh, not being afraid to ask uh, questions, we create an open dialogue with FDA. We're in this together to help bring the devices to the market and to help patients. And it helps to support efficient evaluation so you can do the right testing the first time. Um, we discussed that it's important to understand the benefit and risks of your device and develop the evaluation strategy according to those benefits and risks. There may be opportunity um, to do more or less testing depending on the risk associated with your device and the tolerance of the patient population. Uh, discussed regulatory pathways and issues such as de novo and the breakthrough designation program, which you had heard about previously. Uh, GLP animal studies and clinical studies, including the importance of understanding the patient population, when to use early feasibility studies, and um, how important it is to involve all the key stakeholders, particularly bringing CMS and other payer input early in the process for efficient evaluation in order to um, get coverage of your device on the other end of approval. And uh, also leveraging real-world evidence to support free market and post-market requirements, and but it can also be used for hypothesis generation or finding patients. Um, many, much of our discussion, we were opening questions to the the uh, the people in the breakout session. So hopefully, we we made them more comfortable with working with the FDA and others, and comfortable moving forward, so that they we, they can bring their ideas to fruition. Hugh, is there anything else? Um, no, no, that was a that was a very great comprehensive summary of what I've actually written down as well. Uh, the take home message uh, is FDA is your friend, so don't be afraid <laughs> to reach out and uh, build that relationship. Uh, and I also learned uh, about uh, Dr. Spencer King's uh, history of developing drug eluding stents, and he's one of the reporters too. So that was also another ben added benefit. So great, thank you. Awesome. No, thanks. You know, Jackie, Craig, Yvonne, Misty, Hugh, all, all great summaries. Um, I want to thank the panelists for guiding the discussion and really weaving together all this all of this information, different perspectives, uh, to help us come up with solutions to the uh, the challenges that we all face. Uh, you know, and certainly as well, the active participation for many of you who are participating uh, really helped us get the panels or the workshops uh, beyond informative to becoming educational, especially for many of the trainees and young professionals. You know, as they try to navigate the medical device field. Uh, so, just a, a couple quick thoughts. I won't take long. 
uh, you know, I was able to move around to some of the different workshops. And I think probably like many of you, wish I could have joined all of them as there was so much, uh, you know, so much good discussion as you probably noticed here at the end. Uh, so we are making all the recordings available. Uh, we'll send out a link. So if you want to go back and listen to a different workshop or you want to re-listen to it or, or hear something from, from Dr. Stern in the morning, those will all be available. Um, and also kind of as Jackie alluded to, as a way to continue sharing what we learned, you know, she mentioned she had a bunch of notes. So we do plan to work with all the presenters and the panelists, uh, really with anyone that's interested in participating and, and put a report together that we can disseminate to highlight key findings, uh, different recommendations, uh, and then really emphasize how the emerging programs, collective approaches might lead to uh, different tangible enhancements really at all points in the translational process. So thinking about follow-ups, this brings bring me to the one point I wanted to make in closing. And I think Hugh hit on it too, right at the end there. Uh, you know, communication was really a common theme across the workshops. Uh, you know, and it, it's mission critical from discovery researchers to patients, you know, whether that's communication with FDA, with patients and users, communication with each other, uh, it's just an important area. And in planning this day, you know, we view this as just kind of the start as a way to build new relationships, to start those communication pathways and conversations, uh, begin to open up that exchange of ideas and knowledge. And we really want this to lead to what we hope are long-term partnerships. So, you know, in collaboration with the CTSI, uh, here at Purdue, we're certainly in a unique position to try to bring about, uh, bring together different partners, build relationships, as we all continue working together and trying to develop these innovative products, better treat our patients. Um, so to this end, we're certainly interested in your feedback, you know, how we can further encourage a broad exchange of knowledge and ideas, and so not only across Indiana via the CTSI, uh, but also beyond is really a model for medical translation, medical device translation that's helpful to all. Uh, so before we go, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. Uh, certainly uh, the wonderful participation from FDA, including Dr. Shuren and Dr. Farb in the morning, uh, and, and all the FDA folks, they, they really generously share their time, their expertise to help chair some of the sessions, along with our clinician co-chairs, our co-chairs and speakers from industry, as well as our co-chairs from the Weldon School here at Purdue and everyone else that helped prepare for the day and make it a great success. We certainly could have done this, could not have done this without all of you. Uh, so thank you all again. Have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you George. Thanks, Aaron. That's great. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Aaron. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Thank you very much.